Ok. Ganeshaya Namaha Saraswatya Namaha Shri Gurubhyo Namaha Harihi Om Om Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Bhunattu Sahavidyam Karavavahai Tejasvi Navadhi Tamastuma Vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 Welcome in the presence and blessings of the Divine, most respected uh, Professor P.K. Alwaleji, President IAPT, our guest speaker for today, Professor P.C. Deshmukhji, many uh, stalwarts have joined today. Welcome to all of you and IAPT members. Many of them have joined, my colleagues and dear students. Welcome to this uh, noble lecture series. In fact, it gives me great pleasure that uh, we got this opportunity to host this series of lectures from Central University of Himachal Pradesh. And uh, in this series, this is the very first lecture which is going to deal with this year's Nobel Prize. We are very grateful to Professor Aluwalia for giving this opportunity to us to host this series and uh, also suggesting Professor Deshmukh's name for beginning this series. Extremely grateful to Professor P.C. Deshmukh, who is uh, you know, a well-known uh, physicist, I think, in uh, India. So he's currently a mentor and convener of the Center for Atomic, Molecular and Optical Sciences and Technologies at uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Tirupati, where he's also serving as an adjunct professor. Simultaneously, he's also holding this responsibility at Dayan Sagar University, Bengaluru. Previously, he has worked as uh, both professor and dean at IIT Tirupati. And uh, of course, he was uh, there for a for some time as a professor of physics in IIT Madras. And uh, very interestingly, he had been Dean Academics at IIT Mandi uh, in Himachal Pradesh in 2009-2010. So he's written a large number of uh, research publications, more than 150 in various journals. And of course, uh, he has uh, more than 200 conference publications. And uh, he has authored a book on foundations of classical mechanics and edited a book on quantum collisions and confinement of atomic and molecular species and photons. And two more are in the pipeline. And uh, so with this very brief introduction, which has also been shared with all of you on the uh, flyer, I request uh, Professor P.C. Deshmukhji to begin this very first lecture on uh, the Nobel Prize 2022, which was awarded to this uh, Alain Aspect, Closure and Jelinga for experiments with entangled photons, establishing the violation of Bell inequalities and pioneering quantum information science. Sarah has decided to speak on this topic, entanglement and teleportation, the second quantum revolution. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. And greetings to everybody. I'm indeed extremely grateful to the Central University of Himachal Pradesh, Professor Shastri, uh, Professor Ahluwalia, the Indian Association of Physics Teachers, for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk to students, and especially undergraduate students. And 
the forum of the Indian Association of Physics Teachers is in this forum because it brings all of us physics teachers together. And today it is particularly exciting because I get to talk about entanglement and teleportation, a subject which is so much in the air in the context of Alan Aspect, John Clauser, and Anton Zeilinger getting a Nobel Prize this year for their work in quantum information, the establishing the violation of Bell inequalities, Bell, Bell inequalities, and so on. So let us jump into this subject straight away. And I would like to begin with our perception of what we believe is true. And truth appears to be unreal if we are to believe what is not true. So this is a remark with which I would like to initiate today's discussion and raise this question, is nature obliged to comply with our perception of reality? Because our perception of reality need not always point in the direction of the truth. It may get close to it and it might point nearly in the direction of truth in some situations, but not always. And we must be open to the consideration that what we perceive as true is not necessarily true always. And our concern as physicists is to find out what the laws of nature are and not why does nature behave the way she does. In almost every situation, the why type questions cannot be answered satisfactorily within the domain of physics. It goes beyond physics. You may want to call it as metaphysics. It is the description of the law of nature. What is the law of nature? How do things happen? Rather than why do things happen the way they do? So the right question to be asked by a physicist is what are the laws of nature and not why does nature behave the way she does? And I will illustrate it with an example here. An answer means if you ask why does an apple fall? Why do objects fall? And the proposed answer was that the earth is the natural abode of things. And objects fall just as horses return to their stables. And we could say that, no, this answer is not right. We have a better answer. We can say that, okay, apples fall because of gravity. And we might think that, okay, we have answered the why in a better manner. But then you could also go beyond it and ask, why is there gravity at all? So that's the fundamental difference between questions which are the why type questions and the questions which are what type questions. So the why type question at some level, we are not able to answer. What we can answer is that, okay, this is the law, the apple falls at 9.8 meters per second per second. And if we can describe it correctly, and we we do it with and and the law works whether it is a falling apple or a moon going around the earth or the earth going around the sun or whatever then we have a law of nature so we are seeking an understanding of what the law of nature are and not why does nature behave the way she does so our perception of reality is driven by our understanding of the laws of nature and let's consider a law of nature that we believe we understand and we are comfortable with which is the newton kepler galileo mechanics and we have this model the keplerian model in front of us and um, i i should uh, remind you that uh, there has been work done by ram subramanian Srinivas, and uh, sridham and you may go through this paper and uh, they describe about the knowledge about uh, the planetary dynamics uh, which was in 
Indian literature in the Kerala School of Astronomy even before Copernicus. But that's a different story. So this is something which gives us confidence and we feel that we understand reality when we understand how to solve Newton's equation of motion and get the solution which turns out to be an ellipse and understand the Kepler orbits. And we have reasons to be confident about our understanding because it, because it explains all of our observations. In fact, our confidence level is uh, further augmented by the fact that using this model by doing calculations, one could actually predict Neptune, which was done in 1846, and then Pluto in 1930, which has now lost its status as a planet. We could also observe the precision of Mercury and then realize that, okay, it cannot be entirely explained by Newton's laws, but it requires a correction. And that came from Einstein's general theory of relativity. So in all of this, we are solving, you know, certain differential equations, whether it is Newtonian dynamics or Lagrangian dynamics or Hamilton's dynamics, you're dealing with either a second order differential equation or two first order differential equations. And you integrate these differential equations to get the solution. And you need these constants of integration. And these are the initial position and initial momentum or initial position and initial velocity. And there are students in the audience who would have solved hundreds of problems on Newton's equation of motion or Lagrange or Hamilton or whatever. And in every problem, they would find that, okay, the problem asks them to determine the trajectory after certain uh, statements are provided. And then it says that, okay, it is given that the initial velocity is this and the initial position is this. And without those given, the question is who is going to give them? And how would you, what would you do if these are not given? So it is this scheme of dynamics which is responsible for our understanding of what we call as causality and determinism and local reality. So these terms, which are central to the works of Alan Aspect, Clauser, and Zeilinger, these have their origins in our understanding of these terms, which comes from classical dynamics. And we need to question that, OK, Unless we have the initial position and the initial momentum, we cannot solve Newton's equations or Lagrange's equations or Hamilton's equations. And these are not given. Who is going to give them? The only way to obtain them is to carry out a measurement. And what quantum theory does is to shift the focus to measurement. And what is the initial position and what is the initial momentum? What is the point in the phase space? So that is a question that we must address. And a nice experiment, which is a thought experiment, a Jedenkin experiment, is the Heisenberg microscope. That, okay, if you are trying to measure the position of a particle and you do so using a microscope and the only way to determine its position is to shine some light on it and find out where this object is. And you cannot escape from a certain momentum transfer because there is a certain minimum momentum transfer if the photon gets scattered in this direction and the photon which gets direct scattered in this direction would give 
minimum momentum transfer and maximum momentum transfer if you're seeing it from the eyepiece of a microscope and if you look at the resolving power of microscope and so on you can see do a very simple exercise which you can find very easily done in various books on quantum mechanics that you can reduce the uncertainty in delta x you can also reduce the uncertainty in delta p but the product does not go to zero. And this is the qualitative, this thing, it, it does have some problems and so on. So I will not get into the details of the discussion on the Heisenberg microscope. But basically I would like to bring out the idea that if position and momentum are not known and you are challenged by the task of determining those, then it is impossible to get simultaneous information about position and momentum. And if it is impossible, then without these two constants of integration that you must put to solve the second order differential e equation in Newton's dynamics, you cannot solve the problem. Then what do you do? So you need a completely alternative scheme. And instead of having undue confidence in classical physics. We should now wonder why does classical physics work at all? Because if we cannot find position and momentum and classical equations of motion require simultaneous knowledge of position and momentum without which these equations of motion cannot be solved, the real question ought to be why does classical physics work at all? And then you have an alternative theory, which is quantum theory developed in the 1920s by Schrodinger, Heisenberg, Dirac, many brilliant scientists contributed to this. And as of now, no experiment has been done which is not consistent with quantum theory. Whereas classical physics intrinsically seems to be inconsistent because it requires simultaneous knowledge of position and momentum. And these, this simultaneous knowledge is just not accessible to you. So the question now is why does classical physics work at all? And it turns out that classical physics works quite well in a large number of situations because truth and perception are not necessarily orthogonal. Sometimes they are. But in some situations, they do point in nearly the same direction. So it is an excellent approximation to the laws of nature, which is why it works in a large number of situations. But there should be no surprise that it does not work in every situation. So now we have come to terms with the fact that what we believe is intuitive was because of our faith in our perception being the truth. And now we must open our mind to accept that perception is not necessarily pointing in the same direction as the truth and classical physics works and this can be understood in different ways but one very nice way of looking at it is the Finman's path integral methods of quantum mechanics it means if we accept that okay quantum mechanics provides a much better description of the laws of nature then we know that Galileo Newton dynamics is completely consistent with the Lagrange Hamilton mechanics and which is based on the variational principle and quantum mechanics um, is based if, if you develop quantum mechanics there are different ways of developing quantum mechanics there is the de Broglie Schrodinger way there is the Heisenberg Bond Jordan way of developing quantum mechanics there is also Feynman path integral way of doing quantum mechanics uh, which actually does it in terms of action which is the same which is used in Lagrange and Hamilton mechanics. And when the action is much larger than the Planck's constant, then 
the classical scheme is a very good approximation, which is what answers the question at the top of the screen that, okay, classical physics works in a large number of situations because action is much larger than the unit of action, which is the Planck's constant. I like to call it as a Planck Einstein Bose constant because it acquires its full meaning only from the interpretation of the photoelectric effect, not just the Planck's law of radiation. But subsequent analysis also in terms of the statistics of the electromagnetic field in terms of the Bose Einstein law. So classical physics works in a large number of situations. And I would like to emphasize that we do not have two sets of laws of nature, one for large objects and another set of laws for the small objects. Sometimes we hear remarks that, okay, you need quantum mechanics for small objects, which is true. But it is misleading to think that there are two sets of laws, one for large and one for small. If you were to say that, you would need to quantify what you mean by small and large. Is it in terms of mass or volume or what? Actually, the best categorization comes in terms of angular momentum of the action, the classical action. Nonetheless, there is only there are only one set of laws of nature. And classical physics is an excellent approximation to the only set of laws of nature, which are quantum. And this is the theory which has been developed by many stalwarts. These are some of them on the screen. You know, De Broly, Schrodinger, von Neumann, Dirac, Bose, Einstein, Jordan, Heisenberg, Born, and so on. Niels Bohr, of course. And what this theory is best described in terms of a mathematical structure. And many of you would have come across this very penetrating quotation from Eugene Wigner's paper in which he says that the miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. And Dirac says likewise that if you trust mathematics it will show you the way but there's no escape from it having come to terms with the fact that you cannot formulate a law of nature based on position and momentum you have to open up your mind to a completely different scheme and this different scheme is math is quantum mechanics, which is a mathematical theory in which a physical state is represented by a vector, position and momentum by operators, the time evolution of a state of a system is given by the Schrodinger equation. And what is fundamental to this scheme is the principle of superposition. And this is extremely important for the understanding of entanglement. So here is our early acquaintance with superposition. This is the Young's double slit experiment, except that I have not just one slit, but another slit. And then you have a source. These could be particles. This could be light. I will just call it as a Feynman particle. And there are two possible paths of getting to the destination, which is what we see in this figure. But then in the apparatus, there may be some other pieces like this blue piece over here and this piece over here. I hope you're able to see the cursor. And you suppose you have these additional pieces in the apparatus. Then you could think of alternative paths like this one the green path and it gets scattered through different paths and it is a possible path. There may be another obstruction somewhere and you have another 
alternative paths such as what is shown over here in the blue. And we have not talked about the locations of these obstructions. We must consider all of these paths. And this is the principle of superposition. That to get the correct intensity distribution on the screen, you must sum over all the paths and then take the modular square of that resulting amplitude to get the probability distribution. This is an experiment which all of you would have, the students would have studied in their undergraduate class. You need a sum of amplitudes. What is strange about this is that these obstructions could be anywhere. You have an obstacle on Mars, you have an obstacle on Andromeda galaxy. And your apparatus, you know, the distance, I mean, this is an experiment that you're doing in your laboratory, means across maybe a meter or two meters of your laboratory table. But then here you're talking about paths which can wander through anywhere in the universe, through our galaxy or some other galaxy or anywhere. And all of these must be superposed to get the sum of the amplitudes whose modulus square will give you the correct intensity distribution. So this is mind boggling because the Andromeda galaxy is 2.5 million light years away. And we would be shocked to think as to what would be the speed at which these particles have to travel if it has to go all the way to Andromeda and come back into the apparatus through this weird scattering mechanism. And then you must remind yourself, and this is a wonderful quote from Niels Bohr, which I like to discuss in this context, that quantum mechanics does not answer all questions. It tells you what are the right questions to be asked. Because if you know the path, you know the position. And if you know the position, you do not know the momentum. So don't talk about speeds. Don't even worry about those. So try this if you are caught by a cop giving you a speeding ticket, all you have to do is to ask him, where was I and what was my speed? You can do that. <laughs> but be careful. You may still be ticketed. So now let's go back to our falling apples. And here is a green path, which is a path we are familiar with. Okay. And now we talk about alternative paths, such as this red path, which wanders through all over the universe, and then the apple falls over here. And what you are being asked to do in quantum theory is to consider all of these paths. And it's not that you need to consider all of these paths, and they are not relevant for an apple which is falling. They are actually relevant, except that classical physics gives you the same result as quantum physics in this case, because all of these alternative paths, they cancel each other when you do the sum over squares, when you sum all the amplitudes, because they come in different phases. And because of their different phases, you need both the phase and the amplitude to generate the interference pattern. So the complex nature of the wave function is fundamental to this algebra. And the phases cancel for all these awkward paths. And the only path which is correct is what you get from classical physics. Now, now we understand why classical physics works. Classical physics works in many situations because the non-classical paths are there, but they cancel each other. It's not that quantum mechanics is not relevant for the large objects. It is. It is the only set of laws of nature and classical physics is only a good approximation to it in the large situation. But even in macroscopic phenomena, the same apple, if you keep it on this table, here is a picture in the inset over here. There is an apple which has been placed on a table. And if you try to understand why is the apple in equilibrium over there? And you talk about gravity uh, pulling it down and the normal reaction 
holding it, then if you try to estimate the normal reaction, you cannot get a quantitative equality unless you take into consideration all of quantum mechanical laws. So quantum theory is important even for large objects. There is only one set of laws of nature and that is quantum. Now we are going to talk about the Einstein Bohr debate, but let's understand why there is this debate. Because quantum theory is really mind boggling. Look at the Young's double slit experiment. And you're not able to tell whether the particle has gone from slit one or from slit two. So you try to spy on that. You shine light on it. This is called as a which way experiment, which way detection. And you try to spy on that. Then the interference pattern is lost. But if you have a lens over here, which focuses these two rays, then what enters your eye, you cannot tell whether it came from here or from here. And this is a which way eraser. So the information which you got from the which way detection is destroyed by this which way eraser and it restores interference. Now, this is really mind boggling. And what is even more mind boggling that if you keep this which way eraser outside the apparatus, you can keep this lens well outside. It can be meters away, kilometers away, it doesn't matter. But the which way eraser still restores interference. Now, these are the things which challenge our classical ideas of reality. Because the only thing that is measurable is can be answered only in terms of probability. What is the probability of one path as opposed to the other path? So what the which way marker does is it destroys the interference because it expands the Hilbert space. And then these markers are orthogonal to each other. And that is the reason it destroys interference. So all these are mind boggling ideas. And probabilistic interpretation becomes fundamental to your description of nature. Now, how do we understand this? And this is, this brings us to the Bohr-Einstein debate. And this is something which you would have heard from many sources that Einstein argued against this, that he, he certainly knew that quantum mechanics is correct. As a matter of fact, Einstein could have got many more Nobel prizes, including for lasers. And he, however, felt that, okay, is something missing in the theory. It's, he accepted that there is probability in quantum mechanics. He accepted that it gives the correct description of nature. You can get line intensities correctly, the Einstein A and B coefficients, and so on. But the probabilistic nature, what is the nature of probability? Is it something that we know from classical physics? Because yes, probability is not alien to classical physics. Right from the days of Mahabharat, you know, probability ruled our lives. And Bohr had the intuition that the nature of probability that is employed in the description of the laws of nature in terms of quantum mechanics is fundamentally different from what it is in classical physics. So Bohr had this intuitive understanding of the laws of nature, but he did not have the mechanism to really prove it. And there are these famous debates between Bohr and Einstein. And this is the most famous picture in the history of physics. Uh, everybody who was anybody is in this picture. And at the Solvay conference in 1927, Einstein came up with a number of arguments challenging the role of probability 
or the understanding of probability and his argument was that yes there is probability but perhaps it is because there is something that is there in the system which we do not know this is what has come to be called as hidden variables and Einstein came up with a large number of Jedenkin experiments and these are classic debates between Bohr and Einstein and Niels Bohr ended up winning those debates in a certain sense and Einstein subsequently summarized his arguments in a very famous paper in 1935 so you see that the debate started out in the 1920s in the middle of 1920s and 1927 was the Solvay conference and this paper the Einstein Podolsky Rosen which is called as the EPR paradox and this is a simple exercise means I won't go into the EPR paper itself but just illustrate the fundamental idea in the EPR experiment that if you have a, uh, a, a pair of particles which uh, disintegrates over here and one goes to the east and the other goes to the west you can carry out a measurement of position on this particle and a measurement of momentum on this particle and argue that from symmetry and conservation laws of momentum you can get information about position and momentum both and then suspect that there is something missing in quantum mechanics. So this was the question that was raised by Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen. Can quantum mechanical description of physical reality be considered complete? And the same year in the next volume of Physical Review, Bohr answered that question and he, he argued against uh, the, the logic which was proposed by Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen and concluded his point was that okay Einstein's the, the, the way of looking at things did not necessarily lead to such a conclusion that there is incompleteness and it is because of hidden variables. So these arguments were based on intuitive ideas and this was now 1935 and quantum mechanics was developing many things were happening many particle systems were being studied okay quantum devices were being built and then semiconductors came lasers came and so on and technology continued to benefit from quantum mechanics and the only thing in support of Einstein's argument or in support of Bohr's argument which was opposed to Einstein's was an intuitive conviction about your faith in one way of thinking or the other way of thinking and it was difficult to actually conclude till almost 30 years after this John Bell came up with a very nice paper which is called as a uh, the title was on the Einstein Podolsky Rosen paradox paper published in 1964 in which he came up with a mathematical system it it was a mathematical inequality something that you can test doing an experiment and if you do this experiment and check this inequality then you could conclude whether one system of logic merits your conviction or the other system and what was the basis of these two systems of logic I said that yes uncertainty and probability is there even in classical physics it is there when you toss a coin and there is a statistical probability classical phenomena are not free from probabilities the entire Maxwell Boltzmann uh, law of thermodynamics is based on statistical correlations and you can estimate these and now we are going to talk about a toss done at three different playgrounds by three different captains and then you can ask is there any correlation between 
Dhoni getting heads and Rohit Sharma getting tails. And how is it related to Smriti Mandana getting heads? So the probability of getting obverse and reverse on three different playgrounds and you can build some correlations. And when you examine these correlations, you can ask yourself, what are these correlations based on? And then you must go to the heart of the origin of uncertainty itself that, okay, why is it that you cannot predict that a coin which is tossed will land on heads or tail? And then it is because of certain local hidden variables. You do not know exactly where the torque was applied. You toss a coin. Where have you applied the force? How much force was applied? Okay. What did the coin interact, it, interact with as it tumbled? What are the forces acting on it? Forces by other molecules of the air, for example. They may be very weak. doesn't matter, but they are there. They are not zero. And these are all local hidden variables. And if you had all of this information, you could possibly actually predict that, okay, the coin will land on heads and the captain who knows how to do this calculation would always win the toss. So there is uncertainty, but the uncertainty is due to certain local hidden variables. And it is this type of uncertainty which would impact the correlations between these three experiments, one in the red frame, which is Dhoni's toss, second in the green frame, which is Smriti Mandana's toss, and third in the blue frame, which is Rohit Sharma's toss. Now let us consider another experiment now. So this experiment is again with red, green, and blue experimental devices. And in this experiment, you have got a singlet pair of spin half particles. And it bursts out. And one is observed toward the east by Bob and the other toward the west by Alice. And they were, could be at a certain distance between them. This distance could be uh, an adjacent room, an adjacent laboratory, or two laboratories in two different towns, or in two different countries, or on two different planets, or two different galaxies. It doesn't matter what the distance between these two observers are. And then you can ask, these are spin half particles. and they are in different laboratories. They have excellent experimental resources available to them. They can carry out Zeeman spectroscopy, for example. They can find out if it is a spin up or a spin down. Uh, which way does it go through in a stern girl rack experiment? So all of those details can be worked out. And they are carrying out this experiment in a very sophisticated laboratory. And you can ask, what is the correlation? If Alice gets spin up, what would get what would Bob get? Does he get spin down or does he get spin up? And that is the correlation you're looking for, but not just in this experiment, just like the three tosses of, by the three different captains that uh, we considered. We can consider this analysis being done by Bob and Alice in alternative basis sets. And you know that a state vector can be expanded in a basis, like a position vector can be expanded in any basis. You need a complete set of linearly independent vectors. You can consider them to be orthogonal just for simplicity, but you can have any linearly independent vectors. And you can choose one which is oriented like how I'm showing now and if you rotate it, even then you can have an equivalent basis. And it doesn't matter which basis you use as long as you are using a complete set of bases. And this experiment 
can be analyzed when you talk about spin up or down these up and down are with reference to a certain basis set in which you have the z axis defined either toward up or down or toward left or right or forward or backward or any arbitrary direction in space and you can have alternative sets of bases which are at different angles with respect to each other so you can have a basis which is at an angle of 45 degrees another which is at a an angle of 90 degrees and i represent these alternative basis sets by three these three diagrams they represent alternative basis sets and then you can ask because alice doesn't know which basis set bob is going to use and bob doesn't know which basis set alice is going to use and you can still ask the same question if alice has got a spin up in her experiment and she knows this by performing a stern gulrack experiment on the particle that she detects and bob also detects his particle and analyzes it using a stern gulrack type apparatus and now you're asking for the correlations that okay if alice gets up what is the probability that bob also gets up but they don't know which basis set the other is using it could be the basis set corresponding to the red frame or the green frame or the blue frame and now you're asking for these correlations and we know from quantum mechanics that these probabilities are governed by the modulus square of the coefficient that is a born interpretation of quantum mechanics and the question is very similar to the question about the toss you have three different uh, green blue and red experiments and instead of the heads or tail you have the up and down in this experiment so it's a very similar kind of situation but we must understand the probabilities in terms of the modulus square of the coefficients in the expansion of a state vector in a basis set and it is these coefficients which will dictate the statistical correlations not the hidden variables so this was the debate and it it is when you look at einstein's arguments it would be very appropriate to think that the uncertainty is due to local hidden variables just the way you have uncertainty in the toss and if you analyze it in that context you would understand the correlations in the observations between three different cricket captains who are doing the toss so let us look at these three pictures so you have the red apparatus the blue apparatus and the green apparatus and i have i represent them by these three circles and there are different sections in this diagram and each section is double valued in two ways the red may overlap with green or it may not overlap with the green also the red may overlap with the blue or it may not overlap with the blue so you can mark these sections and we will number them as these there are these seven sections and we can actually describe them so section number one is a part of green which is not blue nor is it red whereas if you look at section number two it is definitely not red but it belongs to the common portion of green and blue so i think the labeling is self-explanatory and you would immediately follow what this labeling scheme is so i will not discuss it any further so there are these different sections so section seven, for example is part of red which is not a part of blue nor is it a part of green but if you look at section number six it is it belongs to the common intersection of the blue and the red but it does not um, have anything in common with green this is the border of green okay and it is easy for you to see that if you look away from this picture okay you have your back toward it and you just stretch your arm 
and touch some part of this and ask yourself what is the probability that you're touching section number one what is the probability that you have touched section number two without actually looking at it then it is easy for you to see that green not blue plus blue not red is greater than or equal to green not red and this is an inequality and what is interesting about it is that when you look at green not blue it actually includes two parts because the green not blue may overlap with red or it may not overlap with red so there is some information which is missing when you just write green not blue so the complete inequality would be actually green not blue includes green not blue which intersects with red and green not blue which does not intersect with red so there are two parts to this and this is the hidden variable this is the missing information you can plug it in it is there it is there available locally and such theories which invoke local hidden variables are those which belong to a class of theories in which counterfactual definiteness plays an important role so these are this is what generates our perception of what is local reality and what the local hidden variables are and uncertainties which are governed by local hidden variables are the ones which physics was familiar with and Einstein had every reason to suspect that the uncertainties in quantum mechanics may also be due to some local hidden variables such as what you see in this figure so counterfactual definiteness really means that not only the measurement that you did has a definite answer but also the measurement that you did not so remind yourself of the EPR paradox which I talked about that you have got these two particles which speed away and you measure the position of this and the momentum of this and try to beat the uncertainty principle by using conservation laws and symmetry now that argument pretends that if you make a measurement of position of this it's momentum can be estimated by doing a measurement of momentum on something else okay okay as if that property is meaningful even if you do not measure it and this is dramatized in the question which Einstein raised does the moon exist is the moon there if you are not looking at it and quantum mechanics demands that measurement is fundamental and you can only talk about what you actually measure and when you measure the system collapses into an eigenstate and that is all that you can tell from the measurement so it is meaningful to assign the property whether or not you measure it so in the previous example in the overlap of red green green and blue it was meaningful to assign the property whether it overlaps with the third color or does not overlap with the third color and that kind of an attribute could be assigned to the situation and whether or not you measure it you believe that it is a part of your reality and this was the popular belief that the sufficient condition for reality of a physical quantity is the possibility of predicting it with certainty without disturbing it whereas quantum mechanics lays its emphasis on the fundamental importance of measurement that you can get information only after you carry out a measurement so this is an example of Bell's inequality and in any theory in which 
you have local hidden variables as we had in the overlap of red, blue, and green circles. You can set up such an inequality. The actual details of that inequality can be different. But there is such an inequality in any experiment in which you demand that you are governed by local hidden variables. And this inequality would hold by all theories which are both local as well as counterfactual. Counterfactual means that even if you do not find whether it overlaps with red or does not overlap with red, whether you measure momentum or does not do not measure momentum, that property exists. It is a part of reality. And if you carry out, if you build a theory based on that, then this inequality should hold. And Bell came up with this brilliant mathematical inequality, which must be held in all theories which are both local and counterfactual. And it turns out that quantum theory is either non-counterfactual or non-local because the Bell's inequality is violated in the experiments which are carried out. And these are the experiments for which Clauser, Aspect and Zeilinger got the Nobel Prize. So John Bell himself was also nominated for a Nobel Prize and uh, if he had lived longer, I'm sure he would have got it. But uh, Bell unfortunately died of a stroke on 1st October 1990 and uh, missed out. But otherwise, uh, the theory that he built was fundamental and eventually it has been tested in the experiments uh, which have subsequently been carried out. And it is for this reason that Henry Sapp describes this as the most profound discovery of science. So it's fundamentally extremely important and it has far-reaching consequences on our understanding of the laws of nature. So the EPR argument, the Einstein-Podolsky argument, that there must be hidden variables which physics could possibly know in the future which would eliminate quantum uncertainty. So this was the EPR argument and what work, um, uh, what we learned from John Bell's work is that the predictions of quantum mechanics are not compatible with the assumptions that hidden variables are the cause of quantum uncertainties. So these probabilities between, the, these uh, correlations between Alice getting up and down are ultimately governed by the modulus square of the coefficients in the wave function. And I will not go through this analysis because uh, it is very simple. It is just based on writing a vector in a basis set. And one can work out this details that, okay, if you have this basis um, in one color corresponding to one orientation of your Z axis or an alternative, this thing and so on. And then you can check these correlations. It turns out that the Bell's inequalities are violated. So it's a matter of detail, which I will not have the time to discuss. And this inequality was rewritten or recomposed in another inequality, which is the Bell type inequality, which is called as the CHSH inequality, which is the work of Clauser, Horn, Shimony, and uh, Richard Holt. I had the opportunity to visit uh, Dick Holt's laboratory at the University of Western Ontario. Um, and um, this is uh, an inequality, which is Bell type inequality, which is what um, Clauser tested and the PhD student at the University of California at Berkeley, uh, Stuart Friedman, carried out these experiments. Uh, they did this experiment on atomic uh, calcium cascade transition. Um, uh, calcium uh, is atomic number is 20. So the configuration is uh, 4s2 singlet s0, but you can also have an equivalent configuration like 4p2 or 4s4p. 
and you can have a cascade transition from 4p2 to 4s4p and then to 4s2 and then look at the photons which are emitted in these two transitions and then check their correlations and these correlations were tested by uh, Clauser and they found that the Bell's inequality was violated uh, and this was the first uh, conclusive or nearly conclusive experiment uh, in support of Bohr's intuition and it is for this reason that uh, Clauser got a Nobel Prize and there were however there are some kinds of loopholes in the experimental setup and these loopholes are that it is possible that because of these loopholes a counterfactual and a local theory can also reproduce the result of the earliest experiments and these loopholes were plugged in subsequent experiments by Allen Aspect and uh, Zeilinger. So now we have come to the second quantum revolution. You have the uncertainty principle that position and momentum are not simultaneously knowable. I like to state it by saying that a dog does not bark and bite at the same time. And you have this interference between alternatives. So you have one path and you have another path and this is what generates the interference pattern. Now what this does is it has brought about, you know, a lot of technology in the last century and semiconductors and lasers and everything are due to quantum mechanics. But now it has all impacted quantum computing and we are now actually in the middle of a second quantum revolution. One can also ask a question, is there a theory of natural laws which is more fundamental than quantum theory? If classical physics was an approximation to quantum theory which worked very well, is there another theory which is more fundamental to which quantum theory is a good approximation and it seems to work extremely well? And you can remind yourself of the claim which was made by Michelson in 1903 in which he claimed that everything that needs to be known in physical sciences has already been discovered and nothing new remains to be discovered. This was Michelson's claim, no less a person than Michelson himself. And we know that the special theory of relativity came after that, general theory of relativity came after that, quantum mechanics came after that. So one can certainly ask, can we expect another theory which will supersede quantum theory? And I don't know what is the answer to this question, but the youngsters over here may want to read further about this. There is a no-go theorem by Lee and Selby just a few years ago in 2018, in which they argue that, uh, you know what a no-go theorem is, that a certain thing cannot happen like the no cloning theorem in quantum information science. So this is a no-go theorem and the Lee Selby theorem claims that there may not be another theory. Of course, there are certain conditions and then one has to get into the details, which I will omit, but I still want to mention it just for the uh, sake of getting some youngsters interested in this work. So now we have interference between alternatives. If you have one path and if you have another path, then these two paths interfere and you must take the sum of the amplitudes to get your answer. And we are used to thinking of in terms of the yes or no logic. Should I fight the war or should I not fight the war? This is the question which Arjuna asked Krishna. And if then else type of logic is what governs your logical analysis, which is what you do in classical computing. You use quantum devices, but you use classical logic because these are built on classical gates. So you have switches, electrical switches, which are either on or off. Whereas in quantum mechanics, you are now forced to consider a superposition of mutually exclusive paths. So 
this path excludes this one in your classical mindset but nature can be understood only by considering a superposition of both the paths which means that if you have a switch which is on and it can also be off a cat that can be dead or alive you must consider a superposition of both the possibilities which are mutually exclusive in your classical logic but not so in nature they're not so in nature and you have tested it you have seen it in the young's double slit experiment you have seen it in the stern girl rack experiment which alice and bob did and that leads you to have different types of physical systems which can actually be entangled no matter where they are located and you can have two physical qubits which are in a state of superposition of zero and one and they can be far apart and because you must consider superposition states and there are certain superposition states not all superposition states but some of these superposition states cannot be factored as a product of individual states these states are the ones which are called as entangled states and if you're talking about two qubits they constitute a bell pair so these are bell states these are correlated states they are entangled and there are four types of bell states these are the four bell states so there are two qubits you have a cat which can be dead or alive it is in a state of superposition of zero and one here is another cat which is dead or alive in a state of superposition of zero and one but the physical state of this two qubit system cannot be written as a product of one state with alice and the other with bob if you look at these states you have got a factor of one over root two so if you take it square it will be half and what you can see that if you carry out a measurement on the first qubit which is with alice the second qubit is with bob if you carry out you cannot predict whether alice has zero or one because both appear with a probability of one half which is the square of this coefficient here but if alice gets if you get alice in the state zero then you can guarantee that bob would also have the state zero so the first question can be asked only with 50 percent chance but the second question is so what is it that bob has can be answered with certainty and this is because of the entanglement and there are these four types of bell states which you can compose between two qubits and this has now stimulated a revolution a second quantum revolution as we uh, refer to it and it is coming from the property of entanglement and teleportation so teleportation is really awesome and i would like to first explain what it is not when we think of teleportation we think about uh, th this song being sung either in mumbai paris vienna sydney everything in a single breath now this is not what teleportation is teleportation has nothing to do with this it's not this at all so teleportation is that alice has got a quantum of information so she has got a physical state which is in a state of superposition it is a cat which is in a state of being dead or alive so it is a superposition of zero and one and alice has this state of superposition but alice doesn't know what the superposition is because she does not know the values of these coefficients a0 and a1 because if she does any measurement on this the system will collapse into an eigenstate it will no longer remain in the state of superposition so the superposition states are very fragile any experiment 
amounts to a which way marker. It amounts to figuring out whether the Feynman particle entered the apparatus through slit one or through slit two. And the system collapses into an eigenstate. So Alice has a quantum state, which is in a state of superposition. Uh, this is the second part of my talk, which is on teleportation. And Can she give this information to Bob, who is at a remote location? This is the question that teleportation addresses. And she can actually do it because they have an additional resource. They have two other cats. This is cat number two and cat number three, who are also in a state of superposition of being dead and alive. And these are in a bell state. And I mentioned just a little while ago that there are these four types of bell states and the bell state cannot be factored as a tensor product of these two vectors. So this is an initial additional resource which Alice and Bob have. And what Alice does is to entangle this cat with this one. Okay. And what this process does is to impact the state of this cat, which immediately impacts the state of this cat. And this is with Bob and he's somewhere else in the universe. He could be in another galaxy, which is what, what makes it interesting to discuss, but he could even be in the laboratory next door. The only thing is that when Alice is to entangle this cat with this one, there is no unique way of doing it because there are four different bell states. It's like carrying out a measurement in a basis set. And the system could be, uh, depending on how she carries out this entanglement, the state of this cat would be impacted in a different way. And unless Bob knows how Alice has entangled this cat with this one, he would not know what is the state of this. And the information can be coded in this entanglement, which Bob can decode. And that is how teleportation is achieved. But mind you, Alice still has to inform Bob how she has entangled these two cats. Is it in this state with a plus sign or this state with a minus sign or is it in this state 0, 1 and 1, 0 with a plus sign or 1 with a minus sign? Now, there are these four possibilities and this information she has to somehow communicate to Bob for which she has to ask her dad to go all the way to Bob in different part of the universe or make a phone call or flash laser lights and that information will not go at any speed faster than the speed of light, even if she flashes a laser light. So there is no question about, you know, beating relativity, that communication is achieved at a speed faster than light. In fact, it is not even appropriate to think about anything traveling at all, because when there is entanglement, if you have these two qubits which are in a state of entanglement, that entanglement will stay as long as you carry out a measurement. It can be an inadvertent measurement because of an impurity in the apparatus. But until you carry out a measurement, these states will remain entangled. It has nothing to do with one qubit moving either slowly at one meter per second or rapidly at half the speed of light or at 99% the speed of light. This motion is of no relevance at all. The entanglement stays. It is broken only by a measurement. So there is nothing traveling at all. So it is, it has nothing to do with the violation of the special theory of relativity, it is spooky, but there is no travel which is involved. And there is a nice word for it, it is called teleportation. Entanglement teleports information, it is not 
the same thing as saying that information has traveled instantly. The term travel is really not even relevant. So now these two qubits can be anywhere in the universe and that destroys our sense of what is here and what is there. Whether these two physical qubits are in two different locations in two different galaxies in the universe or two different laboratories or even adjacent laboratories. The whole perception of here and there is destroyed by entanglement. So our perception of locality, what is here, what is there, what is reality, these perceptions must be modified and it one must give credit to Einstein for raising these subtle questions and I don't look at this debate as Einstein versus Bohr I can also see it as Einstein versus Einstein mind you Einstein is the one who actually developed quantum theory he offered the explanation for the photoelectric effect it is for this explanation that he got the Nobel Prize and he was a great contributor to quantum theory but he looked for a deeper understanding of quantum theory and try to understand is the uncertainty in quantum theory because of local hidden variables and Bell's inequality offered the mechanism to test whether it was due to local hidden variables or it was due to some intrinsic laws of nature which go beyond our classical perception of reality. So the debate was not between one or the other, they were both in search of the truth and what it has brought us to is to change computing from the Boolean algebra of 0 and 1 which you know with uh, the contributions of Claude Shannon, Alan Turing and so on, you have these fantastic computers uh, which, which are, which are governed by classical uh, mathematics but then now this is replaced by the quantum mathematics that you have not just 0 and 1 but a superposition of 0 and 1 and it is this superposition which led to the works of David Deutsch or Peter Shore and Love Kumar Grover and so on and uh, we have we are now right in the middle of the second quantum revolution so it is very secure against eavesdropping for the reason that we just mentioned that superposition states are very fragile. If Eve tries to intercept information which is being communicated between Alice and Bob, then it amounts to a measurement and the system no longer stays in the same superposition that it originally was. So entangled states are very fragile, they decohere and uh, that allows technology to develop quantum networks, cyber security, uh, it can be of great importance in machine learning, artificial intelligence and solving problems like weather forecasting, quantum chemistry problems, optimization problems and so on. So uh, that, with that I conclude my presentation here and uh, we can see that this is all about uh, cats and dogs but then we have the Bell's inequality which comes uh, of great help in resolving in understanding this debate between Einstein and Bohr that are the laws of nature counterfactual and local or non-local and non-counterfactual and what we are able to conclude is that quantum theory is either non-counterfactual or non-local and this destroys our classical interpretation of reality. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Professor Deshmukh, for such an uh, enlightening talk. 
which is uh, very difficult to manage in one hour. And I must congratulate you for doing it for us. And uh, uh, when I look back, you started with very fundamental things to uh, make us appreciate uh, what is actually going on. And I would say that uh, uh, it was a journey of thought experiments which uh, uh, moved from the Einstein uh, Bohar debate to what uh, John Bell did in his uh, Ellis and Bob kind of an, uh, construct to explain these things. Uh, it's uh, not an easy uh, talk to give. And, sir, if I may admit it, it is also not an easy uh, talk to listen to in the sense that there are lots of uh, entanglements and superpositions involved in all of the talk. But what I uh, would say is that uh, I think it was a wonderful introduction to this topic itself, which has uh, excited very many people around uh, us. And there's a, there's a lot of talk among even undergraduate students and postgraduate students that why can't we bring this in our curricula to create uh, some kind of uh, you know value addition to uh, their uh, scientific uh, studies. And I think uh, the way these abstract concepts have given rise to the quantum computers, which are slowly and steadily becoming reality. I think it is very pertinent that uh, we need to really talk about this uh, kind of a topic to our young minds. I think this was the aim of this particular uh, talk, uh, which IAPT proposed. And uh, you agreed for uh, giving that uh, talk. And you really very nicely explained us uh, uh, one very interesting fact, which normally, you know, when one teaches quantum mechanics or learns quantum mechanics, loses sight of, is that there is much more than just solving, say, Schrodinger equation and learning the tricks of quantum mechanics to quantum mechanics as its foundation. And... Uh, uh, to put it like this, that uh, the debate about the foundation of quantum mechanics has, in fact, intensified with the coming of uh, the uh, giving of Nobel Prize this year for quantum entanglement and uh, quantum teleportation. Uh, sir, we would look forward to rather not just one talk, but a series of talk of shorter durations from you to really make our students learn something because algebra is not very difficult actually to do in this particular case. It's only a matter of exposing them and taking them right where, you know, uh, people are using it, particularly uh, computer scientists are using it without yeah. much uh, knowledge about what you call uh, as the basis of of the quantum mechanics in a greater, you know, degree. So I think, sir, your uh, lecture I enjoyed thoroughly. And it was for me also, you know, many th things I heard for the first time. And uh, I would carry one message with me, uh, which your lecture has given, that quantum theory is uh, an ultimate theory and maybe the classical mechanics is a subset of it. But how you look at it is very, very important. Uh, we are grateful to you, sir, for coming on this uh, platform of Indian Association of Physics Teachers. Uh, we have uh, a very large number of uh, members uh, spread all across the country uh, with whom we would like to initiate these kind of, kind of colloquiums, in fact, every month so that we start, uh, you know, uh, making them excited about science and uh, in physics particularly. So uh, I'm really grateful to you uh, that you agreed. And I'm very happy also to mention this, that, sir, this lecture could have more than 100 uh, listeners 
that is the success of uh, this lecture. And there were uh, about 30 people who were logged in on YouTube also. And I'm hoping the, that this will really grow further. I'm very happy that today, you know, very many uh, uh, knowledgeable people, knowledgeable, knowledgeable experts of uh, 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 our scientific galaxy have joined, Professor Satya Murthy, uh, Professor Mangala Sundaram, for example. Uh, Ma'am Kia Dharamveer was also here. And uh, many more who were there. I think they, you have given us uh, also a way to link IAPT with such uh, illuminated minds of our country. I think that is also one of the successes of this uh, lecture. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I'm very grateful to all of you for giving me this opportunity. I have really enjoyed it. And, uh, I have attempted to deal with the subject in my limited way. So thank you all very much for your patient listening. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Okay. Thank you.